delighted to be part of this conversation and really looking forward to um, chatting with you and, and others. Uh, the book uh, gets into this idea of the three P's around the question of recovery. What? How do you define recovery? What do you need for recovery? And uh, and just sort of for context, uh, I got there in the book sort of out of frustration that the sort of medical model for mental illness wasn't really working for us. And so trying to come up with something better than that. And, and um, the actual idea of the three Ps wasn't mine. It came from a, um, a psychiatrist working on, this, on the streets of LA, working in Skid Row. And um, Dr. John Sharon, and I was asking him about what do you, what works, what matters? And he was the one who said, you know, it's so easy. It's just these three Ps, it's people, place, and purpose. So I asked him, well, what, how would you break that down? He said, it's, it's actually, um, could be a lot of things. People is usually, we're talking about social support, having connection, having community, having somebody who, who has your back. And also, ultimately, you're having somebody's back. You know, it's, it's reciprocal. And having those kinds of uh, social relationships, people really matters. Big deal these days when we're so focused on isolation and loneliness. Place, um, you know, he was thinking mostly about having shelter, being out of it, because he's dealing a lot with homeless people. So place in that case is is really just having a safe environment. I, you know, obviously it's much, much more than that. It's it's the opportunity to um, have reasonable nutrition, to be in an environment that's um, encouraging you to grow and develop, and um, and it, and of course is safe. And then I think the third one is really the tricky one because it's the one that we don't talk very often about. In fact, I don't think it's really even in the scope of healthcare yet. And that's this idea of purpose that uh, for people to recover, they need a reason, they need a mission, they need something to wake up for every day. And, um, you know, we're so focused these days on housing first and making sure people have a place to go. But what we don't talk enough about is um, what we call in the clubhouse world, the, the work ordered day, you know, having something to do every day and something that you care about. So that, that idea of purpose um, is, is really a, a critical piece of the recovery story. And when you talk to people who have recovered, and there are very, very many of them, uh, you usually hear you know, parts of each of those three Ps, they, they almost invariably say, well, there was somebody, um, there was a place, and uh, and I found a thing that mattered to me. Um, those are, that's, that's often the recovery journey. Um, and I thought it was important to talk about this in the book because it's not really where we're focused generally when we think about uh, the treatment uh, and and what healthcare looks like for people with mental illness. The prodrome um, is, I think that's actually a term that came from some other parts of medicine. But yeah, it's a, if syndrome is when you have an illness, the prodrome is before you have a syndrome, it's before the illness. And um, the idea is increasingly we now think about an illness like schizophrenia as coming, as starting very early um, and, and meaning Psychosis may emerge at age 18 or 17, but actually, you know, when you talk to people who are having their first psychotic episode, they have not been well for often two or three years. And um, the signs are kind of subtle. Sometimes it's becoming socially isolated, grades are dropping, and beginning to ruminate about some bizarre ideas, becoming kind of paranoid, and maybe they're having these kind of mini psychotic episodes. Um, there are a whole bunch of pieces to this that we're trying to understand, but the reason it's important is um, we've begun to realize in other areas of medicine, like diabetes and heart disease, and you know, you can go down the list, and the that by identifying a problem early, it's easier to intervene and you get much better outcomes. And so this idea of 
being able to define and detect the prodrome uh, means that we might have the opportunity to treat people um, before they actually have a psychotic episode. We're not there yet, but that's the concept. And, and it's kind of significant. And we're not talking necessarily about medication, but there may be a whole range of cognitive interventions. Again, the three Ps might be helpful there as well. And it's simply a way of saying, um, can we preempt um, the all the awful things that happen when you have a psychotic episode, is there a way to get there early? Um, and that's very much a research project at this point. I don't think we know what causes most episodes of psychosis, uh, unless they're drug induced, like with amphetamine, methamphetamine, um, that's pretty clear. And those usually clear up pretty quick, pretty quickly. Um, I, I do think it's fair to say that uh, unhealed trauma is probably not what this is about. I mean, I don't think, you know, I don't think we can um, explain it entirely. But what we tend to do is when we don't understand something, we use whatever metaphor or whatever explanation seems to fit with the times. And this is certainly the time when uh, we use trauma to explain almost everything that we don't understand. Um, and that's not to say that people with mental illness haven't had trauma obviously they have i think we all have and that's but but whether that's really the driver or the cause is um, i think is really not clear many people think that um, an illness like schizophrenia is is very much a biological illness like parkinson's um that or or even like alzheimer's disease and in in the original formulation uh, what we today call schizophrenia was called dementia precox it was a dementia of early life and with the idea that both of them were brain disorders um, it's it's a little difficult to find the specific brain lesion uh, for bipolar or schizophrenia or ptsd or any of these disorders there's there probably um, are well, without question you can find changes in how the brain is functioning um, but whether that's the again the cause or the effect is not entirely clear. So I don't think we fully understand um, what causes psychosis or what causes any of these disorders. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't treat them. And and the good news is, and this is true in much of medicine, even when we don't know the source, um, we're able to still have a real impact on helping people to get well. Uh, and I, I think most of mental illness is in that is in that world. In fact, technically, you know, it, it, with mental illness, when you do find when you do understand the cause, um, usually it, it's no longer considered a mental illness. It's an endocrine problem or a neurological problem or something else. So, um, I, I think all of us would like to think that we can explain these uh, in one way or another, whether it's a biology or psychology or. Um, something environmental, but um, the reality is um, we, we just really don't know. This is such an important question. It's really, um, it's one of the issues I struggle with in the book, most of all, because um, I don't think that we fully grasp how important a question of uh, engagement is engagement in care. Uh, we're, we're as a field, and that's certainly the the mental health care field is very focused on access. Let's make sure that people have access to treatment and make sure that they're getting the treatments that work. Uh, the reality is that a lot of people might have access and they don't want it, and, and we know that about fifty percent of people who could and should be in care are not. Uh, in terms of mental illness, in terms of substance use disorder, it's, you know, like 80% who could and should be in care or not. So there are several reasons for that, but access is often not the main reason. Uh, when you look at the science around this, it's often that people don't, they don't want to engage in care. Maybe they've tried and they don't, didn't like what they found. They don't trust the care system. It's also true that these disorders often, unlike medical disorders, they often get in the way. So 
if you're depressed, you're hopeless. If you're anxious, you're avoidant. If you're psychotic, you don't actually think you're sick. And, and that's, that's, that's really a problem here. Um, and it, it becomes a greater problem the sicker you get. Uh, it's just the opposite of cancer or heart disease. They, you know, the sickest people are the most likely to be in care. In the world of mental illness and even substance use disorder, it's just the flip side of that. It's the sicker you are, the, the less likely you will be in care, which is, is really hard. So how does one fix this? How do you, how do you help somebody who says they don't want help? And there are answers to that, um, but there, there's there's no silver bullet for it. Again, it, part of it goes back to getting there early, so getting to somebody um, at an early stage of the illness and creating a relationship of trust um, and, and educating them so that they do get a sense of uh, what this illness looks like and and what it means to lose insight, which is what we're really talking about here. Um, it's very clear when you follow people over a long period of time, particularly people who fully recover, and many, many do, that um, they they never thank you for leaving them alone when they were sick. Um, and they, you know, that's not what they want. And what they may say was, you know, you were listening to my illness. You were listening to schizophrenia talking, not you were missing the fact that I was still there uh, and I was needing help and you didn't give it to me. I tell a story like that in the book. Um, it's not always that way, but it's often that way. So, you know, I think this is a really critical question for not just people in our field, but for the nation. Um, when you see people who are openly psychotic or who are living under a bridge, eating out of a dumpster, hearing voices, um, what is the right thing to do? Um, is the humane thing to let them die with their rights on? Or is it more humane to find a way to get them into treatment? And how do you do that without, again, violating their trust and making it more difficult in the future? Um, so we have to get really smart about this. Um, again, beyond just getting there early, I think the other key is to create a system in which you have um, peers uh, and people who have been through it who are more likely to be trusted than maybe somebody with an MD or a PhD. Uh, and the the key the key word here is trust. I, I at Fountain House, somebody said to me once. Um, that uh, we change at the speed of trust. And I thought that was just a beautiful way to talk about how to help people. Um, it's really at the speed of trust. And so you have to, and so it could take a long time and it may take, you know, seven visits and not just one. And it may take um, engaging family and it may take a lot of things. Um, but for this field, unlike any other part of medicine, this is the this is the big issue that we have to grapple with. The people who drove me to write the book were really uh, people in my family who struggle with serious mental illness um, and and feeling like um, you know as the years have gone on, like gosh, why haven't we done better? At a time, you know, I was at the National Institutes of Health. And so from sort of the, well, for about 30 years, but particularly in this period from about 2000 to 2015, um, I was there at a time when I got to see some ex just extraordinary breakthroughs um, in, in healthcare and in diagnostics and therapeutics in a lot of areas. And um, I guess, you know, more and more I was thinking, why not us? Like, why why do you have precision medicine and cancer, but we can't develop precision medicine for depression or anxiety? And why are we able to detect um, and diabetes very, very early and our cardiovascular disease early and then end up uh, really averting most of the heart attacks um, when we're not doing that at all for schizophrenia? We're not using the treatments we have. There's a story in the book about a um, 
young lady with uh, anorexia nervosa and her, how her family spends out all of their savings in residential treatment centers that just don't help her. Um, and they finally, after all this time and many years, they get to um, the family focused therapy, which actually is an evidence based treatment that works and she gets well. Uh, but it shouldn't have been so hard. And it had, if she'd had acute lymphoblastic leukemia, it wouldn't have been that hard. You know, she would have gotten the treatment that works right off the bat. And it would have been one that um, she would have gotten whether she, she lived in Ohio or California or Florida. You know, it's everybody agrees on what's the best thing to do. You go and you get a treatment that's actually very, very effective. Uh, it's just not that way when you have anorexia, or when you have um, even OCD, I mean, a whole range of mental disorders. What you get depends on whose door you knock on. And um, many of the treatments that work best are not the ones that are delivered um, by the people that you end up finding as um, therapists. It's important to understand um, this is a relatively new problem. We did not use the criminal justice system as our default mental health institutions. When I was in training or early in my career, it would have been actually unthinkable. It would have been unconscionable. I mean, I, you would probably have said, oh, yeah, there might be areas of the Soviet Union where they do that in the 1970s, <laughs> but we would never, we would never consider doing that in the United States. The lack of, of capacity wasn't an accident. That was actually intentional. We have policies like the IMD exclusion, which means that you can't use federal money for any institution that has more than 16 beds. We don't do that for, again, for heart disease. We don't do it for cancer. But in the case of mental illness, the federal government was so intent in the 1960s on closing state mental hospitals. They wanted to make sure that no federal money would go in to um, the funding of state mental institutions. And the result was we lost that whole capacity. The reality is that we today just don't have, we don't have the beds. We don't have the institutions. We don't even have the workforce. We just, we're missing a lot of those things as well as this whole, whole safety net that we had in the 1970s and even in the beginning of the 1980s. So, so the, the fix here is partly rebuilding um, the infrastructure, rebuilding the capacity so that people don't have to go to jail because you have a better place to go that's in the healthcare system and that's paid for with healthcare yeah. dollars. I would actually prefer to see a healthcare solution, not a criminal justice solution. And I'd prefer to see that we develop um, the end-to-end -end resources that we need, the whole that whole safety net for people with mental illness so that when they're in crisis, there is a place for them to go. They don't have to sit in a jail cell. Uh, and even for people who have complex disorders, dual diagnosis, have substance abuse and mental illness, um, that's those are health problems. They don't belong in jail. I, I missed a P. There's a, there's a fourth P that I think is, we have to talk about is really critical. And whenever yeah. I say that, most people think, oh, prevention. Yeah, that's true. But, but the one that I'm obsessed with right now is payment. Um, because unless we figure out the payment, uh, then the people, place, and purpose are just ideas and nothing happens. Yeah. We ought to ask ourselves, and Florida is a great place to ask this question. It's like, how do we pay for this? I mean, we know this stuff really works. I like to say that if, you know, if the clubhouse was a pill, it would be a breakthrough drug. You know, it'd be a blockbuster because it's very effective. Yeah. And yet um, it doesn't get paid for. Uh, we do pay for things that are far more expensive. So we'll pay for a $3,000 three-day emergency room stay for somebody who yep. is uh, acutely psychotic. Uh, not that's not very helpful to them, and it's not something the hospital really wants to do because they may not get reimbursed for most of that. But it's um, very expensive, or their inpatient stay is very expensive, and the most expensive is their jail time. 
actually our jail was more expensive than the emergency room. So we we're paying for through the nose for a lot of stuff that's not very effective. And yet for things like clubhouse and coaches and peers and the stuff that really is critical for recovery, the three P's, we don't have the payment right. We don't have that fourth P yet. So I think uh, my next book is going to be about that. We're going to have to figure out how do we fix that. And I think for policymakers to hear is that some of the stuff that works is the least expensive stuff. The clubhouse is not expensive, and yet it averts millions and millions of dollars in healthcare. So, like, why, why not invest in the things that actually work? For that, for the audience of uh, people who are connected to criminal justice, uh, my my hope is that um, they get some relief. Um, they've been they've been asked to be social workers, to be psychiatrists. They've been asked to fill a lot of jobs that they didn't sign up for. I think the way to do that is to to get really serious about the crisis continuum that that set of services for people who are in crisis to make sure that you have not just the 988 number but you have a mobile van that goes out so that when someone's psychotic they they see a peer and a nurse maybe not a cop who's carrying a, a weapon um if they do need something beyond what a mobile crisis team can offer, then they end up going to um, some kind of a respite situation where they can um, stabilize over the course of uh, two or three days and um, and that that's not a, a jail. Um, and it's not an, a, a medical surgical emergency room either where they're strapped to a gurney uh, and nobody really gets the care they need. So we know how to do all of that. It's not that difficult. But it has to be set up, and it, it, it is really important that it's an entire continuum. And as people come out of that, there's a real plan uh, so that they maybe they do go into a clubhouse or maybe they go into some kind of um, more intensive outpatient therapy. Um, there's a whole series of options. If you visit Tucson, Arizona, you can see what it looks like when you do it really well. I think Phoenix has done a pretty good job as well. Um, Denver and, and Atlanta have pretty good crisis uh, continuum services. We know how to do most of this. It's not, you know, I come from the, I was a scientist for most of my career. And that was really hard because we didn't really have any idea, you know, like how the brain works or how a particular molecule fits into the, the vast network of other molecules. In this case, I know this isn't that hard because we used to do it. It used to be us. It wasn't that. <laughs> and that was when we had far fewer resources and we knew much less. Um, we didn't allow people to become homeless. We didn't allow them to become incarcerated. They didn't die 25 years before they should have. They didn't all end up addicted. I mean, this isn't this isn't the world that I was in when I started my career 50 years ago, 40 years ago. So... That's why I'm pretty hopeful that we can do this again. That um, it it doesn't it's not going to require some massive breakthrough or some phenomenal discovery. It requires just making a commitment to the things that we're paying for them in a way that makes sure they get done. Going back to the question of being accountable and ensuring that um, people really do care about results and they pay for results and not just for. Um, time spent. So I'm hopeful, and um, I think all of you can be as well. That um, this is this is stuff that we can all do, but we have to do it together. And I wrote the book to start a movement for mental health, and I think I think it's the time. I think we need to all um, put our shoulder to the wheel here. And, and uh, I always say, you know, my grandchildren when they grow up are going to look back uh, at this period of time and ask, like, what were you thinking? Like, how did you? How could you throw all those people in jail? What and how could you have people living under bridges? I don't like, I don't get that. What was that all about? Um, we won't be doing this forever, uh, but it does take leadership to get us there. And um, I'm I'm hoping that maybe the book will help, 
uh, folks like you uh, coming together really can help and you um, you just really stay focused and work on the things um, as you say one day at a time to get them better thanks so much for having me i really really enjoyed our conversation